everybody. Welcome to today's lecture on how to reach the moon. My name is Karen Mikoma. Today's speaker will be Kifiri Damari. Kifiri Damari is the co-founder of Space IL. Kifiri is a BC, BSc and MSc in communication system engineering and a vast experience in computer communication and cybersecurity. In the startup industry, academic defense industry, and in the Israeli army, Kifiri co-founder in men, Kifiri is the co-founder in many ventures, including MetaPacket, Ta Tabuki, Valto, and held teaching in positions at Ben Gurion University, Tel Avi University, and the College of Management. Kifiri's vision is to empower the youth and youngsters to pursue their goals. Dream big, make, make it happen. Kifiri invests in great resources in in nurturing the next generation of groundbreakers and believes in, in investing to, in today's children and breaking the boundaries of tomorrow. Welcome. Okay, now you hear me. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Kifir Damari. First of all, thank you for this introduction. Uh, and welcome to everyone on Facebook and YouTube uh, watching. Um, we'll be talking today about, uh, about a bit my history, about my experience with uh, Space AL, uh, with the first private uh, spacecraft and the first Israeli spacecraft that ever reached the moon. Uh, but we'll also speak about entrepreneurship and we'll actually see how, you know, those things combine and what can uh, we take from, you know, this personal story to any endeavor and anything that you would want to do in the future. Uh, so thank you for having me here and, and let's start. Okay. So one second and we're here. Okay. Uh, so again, my name is uh, uh, Kfir Bermari. I'm one of the co-founders of Space AL. But beside that, uh, you've already heard that I'm a communication system engineer. I've been in the Israeli uh, uh, army, and I was working in cybersecurity, and I founded a few companies in, in cybersecurity. But, what, but when I like to present myself, I actually like to start with the logo on the top left. And this happened when I was a kid. Uh, I was in the Israeli scouts. Uh, I was, uh, I had a group that I was, uh, I was teaching and, you know, we've learned uh, a lot of stuff, but, um, but I like to start there because I believe that, you know, volunteering in a youth group and a youth, youth organization, but then volunteering in anything else uh, that you do later uh, is something that shows you that it's really important to be part of something bigger than yourself. And, and we are going to speak about uh, Space Sail most of this lecture. But be first, uh, be before, we'll start and say a few words about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneur, uh, it's a hard word to say, but the real question is, what does it mean? And I looked up at a few meanings online. I looked at all kinds of dictionaries. And a lot of people say that entrepreneurs are those that invent things, that they have an idea and, uh, and they invent it, and then they make it happen. But I actually really like the, the definition that is on dictionary.com. And that says that, person, that an entrepreneur is a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, uh, especially a, a business, usually with considerable uh, initiative and risk. And the reason I like this uh, definition best is because of those three words. First of all, that entrepreneur can be a business, okay? A lot of times it's a business, but it doesn't have to be a business. It can be any enterprise. And uh, the second part is that you need a lot of initiative. And when I look on entrepreneurship, I look at it as the process of 
not just having an idea, you have innovators that have ideas, but the process of making them into a reality. And, and I think that those people who are able to take any idea and make it into a reality are the, 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 those people that I call entrepreneurs. And we're talking about space entrepreneurs. Everyone are th thinking about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. But I just wanted to take a minute and remind you that you, it doesn't have to be in space. We're going to talk a lot about space in this presentation. But uh, Ray uh, Crook, I don't know if you know him, but he actually was uh, the founder of McDonald's. McDonald's, uh, the burger company, they had only uh, one branch. And he actually make, made it in an organization that became worldwide. It happened when he was 53. Uh, Ray, he started uh, with this. Crook. Or uh, if we look at uh, um, Michelle Zeitlin, she uh, founded uh, one of the biggest companies that are um, working in the field of uh, cybersecurity. And a lot of uh, the website that we will go to today uh, will use, uh, use their technology. So I just want to say it can be space. It doesn't have to be in space. It can be in food, in cyber. It can be old. You can be young, a girl, a boy. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you will uh, make things into a reality. And even for me, even before all those things that I did as, as an adult, I think there were a lot of things that I did in school when there was an idea and you know, one of my teachers wanted uh, to make it happen and he asked me to do it. And, uh, and I said, okay. And then I had to find out how. And, and before we move on, another word about the fact that, again, it can be a business enterprise but it doesn't have to be a business enterprise. It can be a social enterprise. And actually, Space AL, the story I'm going to tell you, is somewhere in between. And I think what really connects everyone, and will that, with that, we'll move on to my personal story, is that I think that there's a sentence that one of my co-founders told me, that a founder and entrepreneur need to be like a stem cell. It needs to become whatever the organization needs him to become. And, and so it doesn't matter what is the task, what is the thing that you want to make into a reality. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you will have to make sure that you will do whatever it takes to make that happen. And with that, we'll go and start speaking about Space AL. In the beginning, I was only an idea, a dream, a fantasy. I was born in a bar to three fathers. Soon, I met the rest of my family. I had people who took care of me and helped me grow. And I grew and became stronger. When I met the president of our country, he told me that I carry with me the hopes and dreams of a nation. And he was right. Landing on the moon is not my only mission. I will carry with me a magnometer to study the magnetic fields of the moon. But one of my most important missions is to inspire our kids so they can dream and explore new worlds. And my mission begins today. A couple of weeks ago, I left home and got on a plane to Cape Canaveral. I had hundreds of talented people who worked hard to prepare me for this day. I waited long enough for this moment, and I am ready. Yada, let's get to the moon. So the story of Space AL actually started for me when a friend of mine, Kol Yariv, uh, wrote on Facebook. He wrote that he wanted to open the Israeli team competing in a competition called the Google Lunar X Prize. The Google Lunar X Prize was an international competition where in order to win, you had to build a spacecraft, to launch it all the way to the moon, to land on the moon, to move 500 meters, and whoever does that first will win $20 million. That was the competition. A friend of mine called Yariv said that he wanna start this Israeli group. I told him, if you're serious, I'm in. And this is basically how we started. Uh, so how do you start when you're thinking about building a spacecraft? We actually uh, met in a bar. The three of us met in a bar that started thinking about how the spacecraft is going to look like. That was on November 2010. Um, and these are the actual pages that we wrote at that day. Uh, and you can see that we'll have, 
we have some kind of timeline and we have come a sketch of the spacecraft and we have a lot of calculations. I will tell you something about these calculations and we actually used the knowledge that we had in physics and we calculated um, the size of the spacecraft. Now, when we wanted to calculate the size of the spacecraft, we first look at um, a phone Every smartphone today, every smartphone in 2010, uh, this has more computational power. It has a computer much more powerful than anything NASA had when Apollo landed on the moon. This has a communication system, uh, communication system a battery, a cameras, sensor, basically everything that you need in order to go to the moon except for fuel. And what you see in these calculations is that we calculated how much fuel do we need we saw it somewhere between one to three to one to four. It means that for every, every kilo you want to take with you to the moon, you need around four kilos of fuel to take you all the way uh, there. Um, this weighs less than a kilo. This weighs around 200 grams. Uh, so times four times five, including its own weight, it's basically the total is around a kilo. Just in case we said five kilos, and with this design, we actually started working, we registered into the competition and start, started our journey. Um, and there's a question by Marcus uh, that asked uh, what uh, power did the spacecraft use and how did the, uh, we build the engine? So basically we looked here and all kinds of different engines. Eventually we used an engine that is uh, uh, usually in space, they use something that is called hydrazine. We use something that is even more energetic. It's called bipropellant. Uh, and basically, it's liquid uh, fuel that we used uh, in the spacecraft. And we took an engine that was already uh, out there. We used something that already had space heritage or be already been tested in space. Uh, but basically, with this design, we started uh, working. Um, and when we started working, we needed to build our business plan. Now, now, this is a trick for you. If you need to build a business plan, if you don't know the five W's, I would, uh, so you should know them. And basically, the five W's are who, what, when, where, and why. So we wanted, we, the three of us, okay, three engineers. I was a communication system engineer. Yariv was an electronic engineer. Jonathan was a space engineer. He was working in the aerospace industries uh, when we met. We wanted to land a spacecraft on the moon. We wanted to do it in two years, in the end of 2012. And, and we wanted to make a project that will be in Israel. We knew that we cannot launch from Israel. Maybe we can speak about that later. But uh, we wanted to, to take as many people as we can in Israel and build a project and send it all the way to the moon. And why? Why is a really good question. You should always ask yourself why. And the reason for us is that we wanted to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. We wanted to show that science can be cool, can be exciting. And so this was part of it. There was also the competition that you know, started this whole idea. But for us, it was about cre creating an impact for the next generation Besides just you know building the first private spacecraft that I find that is exciting you know just by itself, um, and now that we understand you know the business concept of uh, of our business plan, we can actually start. And when you, you want to start and take an idea into a reality, you first need a plan. And I just showed you, you know, the basic sketches of the plan we had. Uh, we needed a team. And so there was the three of us, but we started to gather volunteers and uh, you need the resources, okay? And after that, you can actually go to the place that you can start executing and marketing and fly, uh, finding clients and, and partners. And uh, for us, as I showed you the plan, the plan was basically that in $8 million in two years, in a five kilo uh, spacecraft, we are planning to reach the moon. And we managed to, as I said, gather a lot of volunteers. This is an image in 2011 with, uh, next to me, there is the president of uh, Israel, Mr. Shimon Peres, 
and uh, another respectable uh, lady called uh, Rona Ramon, who was the wife of the late uh, astronaut, uh, the first Israeli astronaut, and a lot of uh, volunteers. And you can see in the front, Maurice Khan, one of our donors. You can see Ariv, and you can see Jonathan, and so many people that we managed to get into the team so we can start working. And beside th those people, we also managed to get the support of the Israeli Space Agency and the Israeli Aerospace Industries. And in the second uh, um, line, you can see all our donors. Uh, Moist Khan, the Khan Foundation, they've donated more than eventually uh, 47 million, and the Edelson family, more than 23 million, and, and others like uh, Schusterman and Segol and Adams that donated uh, also millions. And uh, you have uh, the academia, and you have commercial partners, and you have educational partners, and many more that we manage to get them engaged and you know make make them part of this uh, of this project. And so now we had a plan, we had a team, we had some resources. We didn't have all those resources that I manage, but we had some resources, and we could start with the execution. But what happened is that when we started with the execution. Uh, we realized that the pl our plan wasn't good enough. Uh, we were planning to have a five kilo spacecraft in the size of a Coke bottle, but when we started to do the actual engineering, we saw that the smallest fuel tank that we were able to find on the market was basically roughly this size and it weighted seven kilos. So we realized that we don't have enough fuel because now if you need to take a fuel tank that weighs seven kilos, you need seven times four. This is the amount of fuel that you need just to take the fuel tank. And eventually we moved from one fuel tank to two fuel tanks to four fuel tanks and bigger four fuel tanks. And, and, and eventually uh, only in 2017, we got to the point with it, that we knew how the spacecraft is going to look like. It took us two more years to get to the point that we can have an actually a working spacecraft uh, that is ready uh, for launch. And this uh, gets us to the first uh, challenge that we have. And we had a lot of challenges. I'm going to talk about those challenges through the presentation. And the first, pro uh, uh, the first problem was the, the first challenge was uh, the design. And as I said, it took us a lot of time to understand uh, how we can actually build a spacecraft that can reach all the way to the moon. Uh, and eventually, instead of uh, a five kilo spacecraft, we got a 585 kilo spacecraft. If you take out the fuel, it's 160. Uh, and instead of 10 on 10 on 30 centimeters, we got more like a meter and a half and a bit bigger when the legs are open. Uh, so it became much, much bigger than planned. Uh, and maybe let's summarize eight years of work in one minute. Yes, it was a, a lot of hard work. And now we get to uh, the next challenge and it connects to the question uh, that, uh, that we were just asked about um, at what point did the team decided that it, it can be done on a low budget? Um, and well, from when we started, you know, we were planning to do that with the, the lowest budget uh, possible because, uh, first of all, raising a lot of money is hard. Eventually, the project didn't cost $8 million. Eventually, the project cost $100 million. Now, raising $100 million is a problem by its own. But, but when I look at this channel uh, challenge here, 
I think that for me, it's not just about the fact that raising a hundred million dollars is just a hard problem by itself. It's about uh, the personal aspect of it. You need to realize that we went to, it's not investor, it's actually donors. I will tell you that we actually started as a nonprofit and I will talk about it later uh, more. But we went to all those donors and said, we wanna build the first Israeli spacecraft, the first private spacecraft. We wanna take it to the moon. We wanna do it in two years. We wanna inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. And in order to do that, we need $8 million. And then uh, a few months later, after we started, we realized it cannot happen. We realized the spacecraft must be bigger and now it won't cost 8 million, it will cost 20 million. So we went back to all those uh, donors and we said, okay, we really believed it's going to be $8 million. We are sorry, we were mistaken. It will actually cost uh, $20 million. And they said, okay, and gave, gave us another uh, $12 million. But then it happened again, and it wasn't 20, it was 40, and then it was 60, and then it was 80, and eventually it was 100. And every time we had to go back and, said, and say to them, really, we really believed in what we said before, but we were just wrong, and we really hope that you will uh, help us. And, uh, and they did. And here I need to say a lot of thank you to our donors and all our supporters. And I've mentioned the, uh, Maurice Khan in the front that he eventually donated $47 million. And uh, all those don donors and all the supporter and all those partners that actually helped us uh, in every time that the spacecraft became bigger and the budget became bigger. And you know, there were many, many, many more that helped us to get to the point that will have the spacecraft that will be ready to, uh, for launch. And I must tell you that, you know, I've mentioned the donors that donated millions, but we also had, um, we also had donors, uh, young donors. We had kids who donated $18 that they got for uh, the Israeli holiday of Hanukkah uh, in order for us to be able to reach the moon. Uh, so there were big donors and small donors, and we have to say a lot of thank you to all of them. Um, I will talk about the competition and, and the lunch uh, later for those who've, uh, who've asked. Um, but what I will talk about right now is that eventually after so many years and after going through this designing uh, process and being able to find the right engineering and going through this, this money issues that we had and each and every time to go and ask again for more money and more money, Eventually, in 2019, we got to the point that we had a working spacecraft that is uh, ready uh, for launch. Um, and before we launched it, we did a few things. One thing that we did is we took a time capsule. It's a special disk with 50,000 books in 37 languages. It had also symbols of Israel, but it also has pictures with kids that we took uh, over the years. And, they, and we had blessing that kids sent us. Uh, and although that you will hear soon that the spacecraft, I'm telling you the end of the story, the spacecraft uh, crashed on the moon. As far as we know, this disk survived the crash and it's in one piece on the surface of the moon with uh, some uh, other surprises. So if any one of you want to go and see what surprises we left, it's, it's there on the moon. Um, and another thing that we did is we took a scientific experiment, we took a magnometer to study the magnetic field of the moon. Uh, studying the magnetic field of the moon allowed us to learn more about how the moon was created and, and, and you know, what's happening inside the moon. We had an opportunity for another uh, space selfie. And we packed the spacecraft and took it to the airport and we we're planning to take it to uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida to launch the spacecraft. Now, I will stop for a second in this picture to speak about a few things. First of all, uh, I wanna tell you that um, there was a question, why couldn't we launch from Israel? And we couldn't launch from Israel because basically the, the Israeli launcher can go on to, only to a lower altitude, not to a high altitude. And, and we wanted to use the rocket that will take us as high as possible. Basically, we went to the height of communication satellite, uh, which is much higher than uh, image satellite that are uh, on a low orbit. 
Uh, so this is why we couldn't launch from Israel and we looked in all around the world and eventually we found uh, SpaceX and we bought a launch contract from them. But I wanted to stop on this picture also uh, to speak about another thing. I wanted to speak about the fact that this is the first Israeli spacecraft, but this is also the first private spacecraft in the world. And the reason I'm stopping on this picture is because usually when you have a spacecraft and you want to launch it, you're a government, you're a country, and, uh, and eventually, you know, you'll probably use one of the best um, planes that you have in your air force in order to ship the spacecraft to the launch site. But we are not a government, uh, we're just a private organization. And we, when we had to launch the spacecraft, to take the spacecraft to the, the launch pad in Florida, we just took commercial shipment. And some people say that on this plane, there were some oranges or uh, some other uh, fruits of vegetables. Uh, as far as I know, it was medicine because of the humidity that the spacecraft needed that the the, all the plane will have. But on its way from Israel to Cape Canaveral, Florida, it actually stopped in Europe and dropped some things and, and continued. And that, for, for people that come from the space industry, that just sounds insane. You have a $100 million uh, spacecraft, you're going to launch it to the moon, and you're stopping on the way to drop some things and continue. Uh, but that's something really, really unique in this project. Again, this is the first private spacecraft that ever reached the moon. Um, so eventually, after stopping in Europe, we managed to get to, get to Cape Canaveral, Florida. We connected the spacecraft on top of an, an Indonesian satellite. There was a, a U.S. and American satellite, a small one in between, and we got ready for uh, the launch. Um, and I'm going to show you now the, the video of the, the launch. I'm going to show you one of my favorite videos. I'm going to show you and then tell you why I like this most. Okay, so imagine you're in the middle of the field, everything is dark around you, and you start hearing the countdown, five, four, three, two, one. So the reason I like this video is not just because uh, they are yelling there in the background, it's also because I recognize the voices. And uh, there were people that, uh, there were uh, employees and we had uh, volunteers and we had families and we had so many people that came to be part of this, uh, this moment. It was an amazing moment. Uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, SpaceX did an amazing work and dropped us exactly where they're supposed to. And um, uh, for me, on a personal level, I would say that when we started, the, you know, I, was, I wasn't married, I had a girlfriend, uh, and we were planning to launch in two years. I never imagined that I will get to this moment with a five-year-old kid and a two-year-old uh, daughter. Uh, so, uh, so it was also an amazing moment for me and my family, um, and really, uh, really an exciting one. And uh, we'll talk later about you know what we're doing on our next the next lunch. So all those people that ask questions online, I promise to get to what we're planning to do next uh, in the end of the lecture. And um, and I will tell you that this is the first picture that. Uh, we show the public the first picture with the Israeli flag, with the spacecraft, with Earth in the background, and we decided to take a few pictures like that. Um, and we decided to do that in order to show people that we are on our way, we are getting farther from Earth, and we're getting closer to the moon. The launch actually happened on uh, uh, February 2019, and from that moment, we started our journey a month and a half reach to the to the moon uh, and this get us this this gets us to the next challenge we had and this is navigating to the moon uh, and if you think that navigating to the moon is going to be easy 
I will tell you that we thought it's going to be easy, uh, but eventually it wasn't easy because when we started, uh, there were some uh, malfunctions. Some of the hardware we had in the spacecraft didn't work as expected. And we actually had to redesign the, our orbits. We had to redesign the, um, the path that we wanted to take to the moon. Uh, and it took us a lot of efforts and a lot of time. And actually, when we consulted with people abroad about the fact with, that we have all those issues, uh, they said, OK, you won't get to the moon. But our team had to work day and night to make that happen. And, and you can see here the big orbits and the small orbits. The small orbits is the story of Aviv, one of our engineers. Uh, and that story uh, is that he wanted to marry his uh, loved one, and he uh, they decided to do that between the launch and the landing in this month and a half because we thought we were going to have a lot of free time. And eventually, he got 36 hours to go and get married and then uh, go back to the control room because we had so many things to do. So it really was were challenging times, but we managed to, to tackle all those challenges and eventually to get to the moon. Um, OK, now we're getting to the next, um, next challenge. And the next challenge is the lunar capture. Now, to speak about the lunar capture, I want to show you the moon. And I'll tell you that after two months, after a month and a half uh, that we were uh, in space, we actually got to the moon on the first time. And when we got to the moon, we had to turn around to use the engine and stop ourselves. And the reason we had to stop ourselves is that the moon's gravity started pulling us. And it was pulling us so strong that it actually got us to a speed which is higher than the escape velocity. That means that if we could not stop ourselves, we would just fly away to somewhere unknown in the middle of the solar system and never reach the moon. So uh, the lunar capture maneuver happened on April 4th, 2019. And when we look back, we say that in this moment, we actually made history. In this moment, we became the first private organization to reach the moon. Uh, and we made Israel the seventh country in the world to do so. And so it took us a month and a half to get there. And we had this lunar capture. And then we had another week uh, next to the moon. Um, but before we'll get to the next challenge, uh, we're talking about the lunar capture. I want to show you how this maneuver went. And uh, let's see. So this maneuver succeeded, and we got some amazing pictures from the moon. This is the first picture we ever got from the moon uh, from a close by taken by the spacecraft. And uh, this is one of my favorites. And if you don't understand what's the white thing here, uh, so some people in the internet helped you. And, uh, and as you can see, sometimes when you're, uh, next to the, when you're on the moon, basically, and you look at Earth, sometimes Earth looks like a moon. Um, and we got amazing picture and we were all excited, but now we need to speak about our uh, fifth challenge, which is the landing or let's say soft landing. Um, we cannot ign ignore this one. Uh, and we wanted to land, but as I said, we wanted to soft land. We wanted that the, the moon will, uh, will stay smiling. Uh, and I can tell you that in the beginning, everything worked correctly. Everyone, everything uh, looked good. Um, and maybe let's see how, how it started. You can see here, all the engines are working. We are 
21 kilometers above the ground. So we are in the braking process. The braking process is working well. We can see the spacecraft slowing down. You can see the velocity as we are slowing down and the spacecraft is doing exactly what it's supposed to do right now. So everything looked, everything looked good. We got this picture, this, um, this picture. We also call this amazing picture, the $1 million uh, picture. And the reason I'm saying it's the $1 million picture is because eventually we actually got a $1 million prize. Uh, to all those of you who ask about what happened in the competition, the competition actually was supposed to end in uh, the end of 2012. It was postponed to 2013, 14, 16, 17. And eventually on March 2018, um, they decided to close the competition. So basically there wasn't any competition anymore. But the X Prize, who started this competition, decided that although there isn't any competition, they found uh, they, they took one million dollar from their own money and gave us uh, this uh, this uh, one million dollar, and uh, we went to uh, Los Angeles and we got the million dollar and we got a trophy, and it was really exciting. Uh, but now. We'll go back to the, the lunch and later on I'll have time to all those questions. And, and when we were 13 kilometers above the ground, we got this picture and also this happened. I am your time, not okay. There was a problem with one of our uh, subsystem, the IMU, the inertial measurement unit, the same thing that you have on a phone that uh, in that knows how the phone is moving. So if you have a game that you're moving the phone, so basically it's the same component you have an IMU inside your phone. And um, instead of uh, Houston, we have a problem, Yehud, we have a problem, Yehud is the city in Israel where we had the control center. And I'll tell you that it actually wasn't just one problem. There were three problems. Um, the first problem was the problem with this uh, IMU. The, the IMU stopped working correctly. And the, the team uh, decided that they want to help the spacecraft. They wanted to restart this IMU. So uh, by the time they realized they shouldn't restart the IMU, the command was already sent. That by itself wouldn't have done something wrong unless we had the third issue, which was the software architecture. And the software architecture uh, um, made the whole computer to restart. When we wanted to restart one, it actually made the second one restart and then the computer restart. And eventually when the computer restarted, the engine uh, shut down uh, because the spacecraft didn't know it's, it's landing. Uh, and by the time it came back, it was too late. So it wasn't just one problem. We had three problems. We had an, an, an hardware issue, a software architecture. And the third part was human, but it wasn't a human mistake. It's not that someone accidentally pushed a button. It's the fact that, um, as we understand now, there was some uh, knowledge that part of the team had and other people didn't. So there were some testing and results of those testings that the mission uh, controller, the one who had to make those decisions, didn't have uh, this knowledge. He didn't know that uh, this might happen. So he took the best decision he could. But uh, when we look back, we understand that we needed to make sure that all the, um, all the results uh, will be clearly passed to everyone and to make sure that in this decision process, um, we'll be able to get more input from, uh, from other people in, in the team. And, um, and as I said, the engine came back, but it was too late. And maybe let's see the final moments of the landing. Now look at the height. The spacecraft try to enable the engine. The engine is going to go come back in a second. Look at the height of the spacecraft. It's going down from 600. Uh, look. We have the main engine back on. No, but it's not. No, no. We lost a lot of weight, but the weight is not clear. 
he's saying that we lost a lot of altitude. Our situation is not clear. Well, basically, our situation is really clear. We went down from 600 meters to 149 meters. We are at a speed of one kilometer per second, a uh, thousand meter per second. And uh, so we got to the moon. We got on a speed much higher than anything that we anticipated and any, anything we wanted. NASA took pictures of the landing site a few days later. And you can see on those pictures also that we definitely made an impact on the moon, no doubt about it. Um, and I will let's speak about what's special about this mission. So this is the first uh, Israeli mission, but this is the first mission of a country in the, the size of Israel. This is the first private mission in the world. Uh, the, the, the smallest spacecraft that uh, uh, got to the moon almost without, with no redundancy. We didn't have backup computer. We didn't have backup of different things. But although the component, the hardware that failed, it was IMU2, which means that we had backup to that specific uh, part. Uh, but something really important, and I mentioned that a bit, and maybe we'll speak about it now a bit more, it, it wasn't just about the engineering. It was a lot about the education. Uh, and I'll tell you that we got amazing responses from all around the world, the head of NASA, previous heads of NASA, people in Europe, people really, really everywhere. And we got uh, one of the highest uh, awards in Israel to light the torch in Israel's Independence Day. Uh, so it was a really big honor. Um, but now we're going to speak about the last uh, challenge that, uh, that we have and then move to some questions. And the last uh, challenge we had is that we wanted to make sure that this moment will have an impact and not just an impact on the moon, but we wanted to make an impact on Earth. We wanted to use that moment to show that science can be cool, that science can be exciting. Uh, um, we wanted that those kids that will watch the, the landing uh, will realize it's not just about uh, solar panels, uh, it's not just about uh, in, um, it's not just about the solar panels. It's not just about the, the the fuel tanks. It's a lot about creativity and teamwork and overcoming so many obstacles during the way, and dreaming and passion and devotion. We wanted to make sure that they will realize, you know, to make such a dream into a reality. To take an idea and make it make it into a reality. You need to work hard to make it happen. Um, and you need to overcome so many obstacles through the way. Uh, and uh, you need to have an amazing team. And this is the team that we had in 2019 with a uh, hundred of people that were working together to make this dream into a reality. Really talented people, those you cannot see their faces those that are standing on the opposite side uh, are working the Israeli aerospace industries and you cannot see their faces because of that. Uh, but really an amazing team. And what we did is we had hundreds of volunteers beside this 100 people team that went into classrooms and told our story and said, yes, it's rocket science, but this is something you can understand yourself. And we went to kindergarten and to older kids. We also gave them to tackle our engineering problems. We gave them the, the problems and gave them to find solution, to lose solutions by their own. And we've been everywhere that we could uh, from basketball game to soccer games to literally everywhere that we could to get people in, in Israel and also around the world excited and to start speaking about in, you know, this journey uh, to the moon. And I will tell you that eventually we got amazing reactions. In the beginning, we like to say that we wanted to create an Apollo effect because when Apollo landed on the moon, there were so many kids that got excited and eventually went to be scientists and went to be engineers. Today, we call this uh, effect that we made in Israel uh, the Bereshit effect. The Bereshit is the, the name of the spacecraft. It's actually Genesis. It's the first word in, uh, in the, the, the Bible. Uh, and uh, it also means uh, the beginning. So in the beginning, and for us, it was a beginning of future generations of scientists and engineers. And we got so many responses. What you can see in the background is kids dressed up in the Israeli Purim. It's like the Israeli Halloween. And uh, so many kids dressed up as astronauts, as, as the spacecraft, and they got excited. And it really was an amazing um, response. And, and I think that something really crucial that happened when we crashed on the moon, and not just soft landed, 
is the fact that people realize that science is hard. It's not easy. You need to work hard. You need to continue working and things won't work as expect, expected always, but you need to continue to make your dreams into a reality. And I believe that the way to change the world is through science and technology. And I think that there, is a, there was a big message that came out of it. Now, before I'll go to the questions you have, a, a few last words about the future of space and, and what it's are we not doing today. We need to work so hard. today we are continuing our work, in, first of all, in inspiring the next generation of scientists and engineers, but also we believe that even people that want to, kids that don't want to be scientists and engineers, everyone need to remember that they need to dream big and follow their dreams. In parallel to that, we're actually working on another mission. We call it uh, right now the Bereshit 2 mission, and we're going to tell some more things about it, but I can tell you right now, and also connects to some of the questions you have, that we are hoping to make it a more international mission. And so uh, maybe hopefully in the future, we'll have more opportunities uh, uh, to work together. Um, so this is Bereshit 2, another mission that we're working on the plans right now, and I hope that in a few weeks we'll be able to tell the world what we're planning. Um, time for questions. So, uh, thank you. Let's see what questions you have. If you want to open. Okay, maybe I go to some of the questions you've sent me. Uh, so are we planning to extend the reach to uh, parts of Africa? As I said, in the next mission, it could be possible. Uh, but again, we are right now in planning uh, stages of that mission. So we'll, we will have to see. Um, how many prototypes did we make until we got uh, to the finished uh, project? So basically, we had, maybe I can even move to that. One second. I have some final words later, but maybe I'll show you just because you've asked. Okay. Tum, tum, tum. Okay. Uh, so if we look here, you can see that we eventually from this uh, concept that we had, uh, we got to a uh, CubeSat, a nanosatellite design. We moved to two fuel tanks. Basically, 2012 to 2014 was two fuel tanks. And eventually, in 2014, we moved to four fuel tanks. And I think around uh, 2016, 17, we moved to bigger four fuel tanks. So basically, we had four design. Uh, regarding the actual uh, model itself, we had only two. We had a structural model when we did all the different experiments on, uh, and we had the actual model, the flight model that went into space. So uh, this is basically what we have. Um, let's see, new message. Okay. Um, another question you had. Out of the 100 million, uh, how much can we reuse? So basically, we also looked at the uh, possibility to build another mission just like it. Now, I should mention that from this 100 million, 20 million was just the, the launch itself. So we can just take out 20, and this is just for buying the launch that will take you out of the atmosphere. Uh, this gets the project actually to uh, $80 million. And when we looked about the possibility to do the same mission, just another spacecraft as is, and this is not what we're planning to do. We want to do something even more crazier and special and unique. But to make the same project, we saw that we can uh, basically save uh, around $20 million. And that means that uh, it will be $20 million for the launch and another 60 for the actual project. And uh, so this is what we estimate that to create another project which is similar to the previous one. Um, let's see if we have other questions. Uh, there were many volunteers. The participation we're gonna contribute to okay, creates. Okay, so there was a question about if the volunteers, if when they uh, took part of uh, they took part in this project, did they get uh, any um, a 
academic uh, grading uh, in university or school. So I, I will tell you that most of volunteers weren't, weren't just students. We had some students that uh, were actually part of a really special project uh, in Israel. It was called the President Kids. And it was kids in high school that were working in the university. And they actually, as part of their study in the university, helped us to find the right landing site of the, the spacecraft. So they had uh, they have done it officially as part of their uh, as, the, as their studies, but most of the people who volunteer were just experts or other people that had some expertise uh, that helped us, not as part of any school or university. Um, what have been the return of investment so far since we launched? So again, we are a nonprofit. We are not a for-profit company. Uh, so it's not a regular uh, ROI, return of investment. Uh, we look at it as a social ROI. Uh, we had, again, we had millions of uh, kids, mostly in Israel, but all around the world that were inspired and engaged. When we look at the number of kids that decided to go and study uh, even uh, aeronautical engineering in Israel, in the university, the number became much higher than anything in, in, in the history of Israel. And uh, so we look at this and the impact uh, about, uh, we look at the impact on the next generation, and we look at the impact on the space industry in Israel, that there are some new opportunities that were opened for, this, uh, uh, for the space industry. Uh, so that's the return of investment that we're looking at. Any other questions? Uh, how can we stay in touch? Uh, so first of all, Noah, I think uh, answered. You can, you're welcome to follow our uh, Facebook uh, uh, page. And uh, we have a website. We're going to have a new website uh, soon, but you can go there to the Facebook and or just look for Space Sale on Facebook and you can follow us. So it's Space Sale. And um, other questions? Any questions? Okay. So I think we, we went through all those questions. Uh, I have some final words. And uh, know if I, would, I missed something, uh, uh, let me know. Uh, first of all, before we finish, I want to say, uh, first of all, a lot of thank you for uh, both MTOTO to make this happen, but also to Alan from uh, uh, STEM 2013. Uh, for again making this possible, um, STEM uh, 2013 and Ellen are developing a CubeSat mission and uh, uh, and civilian space program in Kenya. Uh, so also please follow up uh, on them on Facebook. Uh, but uh, but really, thank you for having us here, and we hope that you know all the civilian uh, project that we have in Kenya and Israel maybe will unite in, in the future. And some final words that uh, I have um, is that when we're talking about um, Space IL, we were talking about uh, space and entrepreneurship and, and a lot of things. But for me, what we're actually talking about are uh, dreams. Um, and when we are talking about dreams, everyone have their own dreams and every one of you have your own dreams. And then I was really inspired when I saw this sentence in the first time. And uh, nothing is impossible. The word itself says impossible. And for me, this means two things. The first, the first thing is sometimes when you take something impossible, Sometimes you need to break it down a little. A little is enough to see that it's possible, somewhere between the M and the P there. But the second part, which is the most important part, is that the only way to make something impossible possible is if you are going to do whatever is needed to make that happen. It's the I'm part. So I said that everyone have their own dreams and all of you have your own dreams. So I really want to wish you all that you will do whatever is needed to make your dreams come true and really before we'll finish, uh, these are, this is my wife and my kids. And if a second ago, I uh, said that I wish you all that you will um, um, do whatever is, is needed to make your dreams come true. I want to wish myself, but I believe all of us, that uh, you will also dream about how to make the world better for our kids. 
And with that, I'll say thank you and stay healthy and dream big and go and follow those dreams. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Uh, Jennifer has something to say probably before I close. Yeah, that last part. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Jennifer, you want to say something before I close, probably? I I just uh, just say it and then uh, Karen will finish up. It's all right. For joining. Uh, uh, all right. Fear and uh, Space IL team, we truly, truly, truly from Kenya and uh, uh, even India. So people are listening to you today. We want to express our appreciation for well, you having taken time, I know, out of a busy schedule to talk to us today. I know that everybody who attended will be leaving here quite inspired. And in Africa, we are very happy that we at least got to see what somebody who is reaching out to the moon needs to do before they actually embark on the journey. Now, for everybody who attended, we have just a few announcements. Uh, Space IL has started a very wonderful program for us, and uh, we are setting up a second uh, presentation where we will have somebody talking about space colonies and the kinds of people who will live out there and work out there. And uh, additionally, we also have a space camp coming up in 2021 during the school uh, vacation in April. And uh, Fir, I need to update you on something. You mentioned that possibly some people from Africa might be participating in Bearship too. I'm happy to, to update you that Argentina's Satellogic has offered a, a couple of people in East Africa an opportunity to be part of a team that builds a small educational part of a payload that would be carried out to space on their 2024 mission. And therefore, some of the people who might derive uh, technological training from that program will probably also reach out to Space IL to maybe contribute some technical expertise. So it is wonderful that uh, we have been able to link up today. It's a wonderful time for East Africa and for Kenya's space uh, development uh, ecosystem, particularly when you talk of civilian participation in it. We look forward to continue, uh, continuing to talk to you. And I'm sure that as you go on to your second mission, some of the people who attended today might reach out to, do, to you once or, or, or any other time, and you'll also respond so that they may stay inspired. Thank you so much to Space IL, to you, Phil, and to Noah for all the support you've offered. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you and good luck in all those projects. And hopefully we'll be able to do more things together. Yes, we will. Over to you, Jane. Um, please switch off your videos. Thank you, everyone, for join, joining us today. Um, unfortunately, this video won't be available in the next one hour. So if you want, if you didn't understand anything or wanted to get, go back to something, um, hurry up because in the next one hour, we are going to be pulling it down. And thank you for Kafir to make, for making time for, to explain to us. And thank you for Alan and Noah organizing this. Thank bye. You. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Yeah, thank good you. evening. Bye, everyone. All right, Noah. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Omkar, 